So what we are doing now is trying to understand what the spherical derivative of uh, uh, meromorphic function is. Okay. So um, well, you know, uh, the the reason for all this is uh, uh, this idea of spherical derivative uh, is important uh, to study uh, the topology of families of uh, meromorphic functions. Okay. See, the reason is that normally. Um, uh, you know there are a, uh, there is a relationship between uh, uh, see basically uh, uh, we are interested in compactness okay and you know uh, compactness uh, is the same uh, uh, is strongly related to uh, uh, sequential compactness okay uh, which is that you know given any sequence you have a, at least you are able to find a convergent subsequence okay and of course, uh, the, if you are worrying about Euclidean spaces, then you know compactness is the same as closed and bounded. But then, you know, for saying things like bounded, you need a metric and so on and so forth. But you know, <coughs> if you are working with faces, spaces of uh, 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 holomorphic functions or analytic functions, uh, the point is that uh, you know you will have to work only with normal convergence. You won't get uniform convergence. Okay you will get uniform convergence only on compact subsets and then uh, it is uh, 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 had it been uh, only uniform convergence then you could have taken the uh, the soup norm okay, to and you could have used that to define a metric. But the point is that you do not have uniform convergence you have only uniform convergence only restricted to compact subsets that is called normal convergence. So, it is not so easy to think of a metric all right. But then uh, you still want to think of compactness and compactness is kind of related to sequential compactness and so uh, then uh, uh, you know this is also connected with uniform boundedness, it is connected with equicontinuity okay? and it is also got to it is also connected with uh, for example, uh, uh, if you want um, uh, uh, boundedness of the derivatives. Okay? So, these are a, a bunch of interrelated results okay? uh, in the on the topological side this is the so called arzela ascoli theorem okay? and on the holomorphic side or on the complex analytic side it is the so called Montel theorem okay? which we need to prove. Okay? And uh, so, you see the somehow we want to do it not only for analytic functions we want to do it for meromorphic functions because you see we have to worry about meromorphic functions because that is the these are the functions that will you need to study families of such functions to get to the proof of the Picard theorems which is what our primary aim is. Okay? And since you are worried with meromorphic functions the problem is that you know uh, 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 they are not always different they are not differentiable everywhere and I mean they are not analytic everywhere everywhere if you go to a pole at the pole of course the function goes to infinity. So, you cannot you cannot differentiate the function at the pole it is not differentiable because it is a singular point basically. Okay. So, uh, so your usual derivative will not work your usual derivative will not work at a pole. So, what will you do the, uh, the method is that you introduce a spherical derivative because a spherical derivative is something that will work even at a pole that is the whole point. Okay. So, I want to tell you uh, in general why, uh, why we are getting so, so worried about uh, why we are making so much noise about this spherical derivative because see that is that is what we need that is the thing that that will work even for uh, meromorphic functions it will work even at poles okay? whereas ordinary derivative you cannot think of at a pole because it is a uh, the moment you say pole it is a singular point and at a singular point derivative does not exist. So, 
you know, uh, you are in lot of trouble. That is the reason we introduce a spherical derivative. So, I was, uh, so let me continue with what I was telling you last time. I was trying to tell you that the, the spherical derivative, uh, if f is a, if small f is a meromorphic function, uh, as you can see uh, here, uh, so let me, let me use a different color for, for the moment. Um, say so so if you have this f which is a, a meromorphic function on a domain d uh, in the plane uh, then there is this spherical derivative okay f hash of z and in fact this is spherical derivative uh, uh, in absolute value mind you i have put two times mod f dash of z by 1 plus mod f z the whole squared so it's a non negative uh, real valued function okay Normally, a derivative should be derivative of a complex valued function should again be a complex valued function, but this is not exactly a derivative which is complex valued. It is actually positive real, non negative real valued, and it is actually so you should think of it as uh, 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 absolute value of the derivative, okay. So, we will when we say spherical derivative, I mean absolute in absolute value, okay. And why is it that we are interested in this ab absolute value because it is a scaling factor, you see. Uh, uh, so, you see what is happening, the, you see the point is that. You know, uh, as I to, as I was telling telling you last time. So if you look at this, if you take this uh, function w equal to f of z, if it's a transformation uh, from uh, the z plane to the w plane, okay? Then you know uh, you assume it's uh, it is uh, an analytic function, okay? And assume it's not constant. So then what happens is that you know if it's a non-constant analytic function, then the image of any open set is open. So if I start with this open set D here. Uh, which is supposed to be for example in this diagram the interior of this dotted uh, boundary okay then uh, the image of that which is f of d is uh, is an open set okay and if i take a curve gamma uh, inside d the image of gamma will be f of gamma okay and this f of gamma is now going to be a curve in the image which is f of d which is open and you know if i calculate the length of gamma uh, it's given by the formula namely integrating mod dz okay because mod dz is the infinitesimal version of the euclidean distance which is mod z1 minus z2 okay so you take if you take two points z1 and z2 on the complex plane then the distance between them is given by mod z1 minus z2 if these points are very close to each other you can call one point as z1 you can call the next point as z1 plus delta z then mod z1 minus z2 will become mod delta z and you replace delta by d to get the infinitesimal version, so you get mod dz. So mod dz is uh, just uh, the infinitesimal version. Okay, uh, it is called. Uh, you may also call it the, you know, uh, the element of uh, arc length, which you have to use to integrate. Okay, and if you integrate the curve over the arc length, you will get the uh, length of the curve. Okay, and of course, it's very important that the curve needs to be rectifiable. Okay, it should be a curve which has finite length. Okay, and that's why we always put a condition that uh, we work only with contours and contours are you know uh, they are continuous images of a closed bounded interval which are in fact piecewise smooth and uh, in fact piecewise uh, continuously differentiable okay and for such uh, for such curves for such contours length will always uh, be a finite quantity and uh, uh, so so you have this so so the point is that is you integrate mod dz you will get the length of this gamma all right now on the other hand what happens if you uh, in, the, in by the same philosophy you know if you integrate mod dw uh, uh, here over its image which is f of gamma you should get the length of f of gamma which is the f of gamma is the image of gamma under f it's the image curve but you know uh, but here uh, the variable of integration w is f of z so if you integrate mod dw uh, I mean if you if you substitute uh, for w f of z then mod d f z will become mod f dash of z into mod d z okay and you see the difference between uh, this formula here and this formula here is that there is this extra factor of mod f dash of z okay. So what it means is that if you simply integrate over mod d z you will get the length of the source curve if you integrate if you multiply it by the modulus of the derivative you get the length of the target curve the image curve so the point is that the the extra factor you have to put 
in the integrand to get the length of the image curve is the derivative, the modulus of the derivative. Okay. Now, in the same way, uh, what is happening going to happen is the following thing. If you take f to be, if you take the function f to be a meromorphic function on D, okay, now what you are doing is your, you see you have the, you have the complex plane okay, and you have this domain D inside it and you have this function uh, uh, f uh, and this is well, I am now thinking of this function as a function into C union infinity. Mind you, it is a meromorphic function. So, I am thinking of it as a continuous function into the extended complex plane because I define the value at a pole to be uh, infinity okay, and with that it is continuous. And how do I actually think of this? So, you see there is this, there is this, uh, this is identified via the stereographic projection. to the Riemann sphere okay, which uh, I, 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 I think I should put it as S2, S2, the 2 sphere okay, centered at the origin in the in 3 space, uh, real 3 space radius 1 unit okay, and with the north pole being identified with the uh, point at infinity. Okay. Now you see what you do is you essentially think of this, look at this function. Okay. If you look at this function, think of the function as a map from the domain in the complex plane onto the sphere. Okay, so geometrically, uh, whenever you're thinking of the Riemann, uh, whenever you're thinking of the extended plane, think of the Riemann sphere geometrically. That's how you should think of it. Okay, so this function f, think of the function f as going into the Riemann sphere. So you know, if you want, you know, um, it's abuse of notation. I will still call this as f. Okay, in fact, I should. It is f followed by this stereographic projection. So in principle, I should call give it some other name, but I'll still call it as f because I am thinking of this as an identification, I am, I am thinking of the stereographic projection as an identification. Okay. I am identifying the extended plane for all practical purposes with my Riemann sphere. Now what happens? Now what happens is that you see on the one hand you have the complex plane okay, and you have this domain in the complex plane. Okay. Uh, uh, so this is my domain in the complex plane uh, and uh, the variable here is z and then on the other hand I have the sphere, I have, I have the Riemann sphere. Okay, and uh, what is happening is that uh, uh, you know if I now take uh, if I now take a small uh, if I take a if I take a curve gamma here, okay, in the complex plane, uh, in the, in 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 my domain, and take its image under f, okay, then what will happen is that the image of this curve will also give me a curve here, on the Riemann sphere, okay. Now. Uh, so this so this will this will become the curve f of gamma, and how will I get the length of f of gamma? Okay, now think about uh, uh, what I just told you some time ago. To get the length of the image curve, you have to integrate over. You have to integrate over the original curve with the with the you with the original uh, you know uh, 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 with the original uh, infinitesimal. Uh, element of arc length and then you have to scale it by the modulus of the derivative. Okay. But now you see what I am doing is I am actually trying to get the uh, uh, I am trying to get the length the, the, the length of the image curve it is the, the, the length I am getting is actually the spherical length. See it is the length on the Riemann sphere and the length on the Riemann sphere corresponds to the length on the uh, on the extended complex plane given by the spherical metric. See the only the only point you have to remember is in my target the metric is not the Euclidean metric, it is the spherical metric. Okay, I have to use the spherical metric, I have to use the element of the spherical metric is what I have to integrate. So what is the length of uh, uh, f of gamma under the spherical metric? So I will put L sub s to just to indicate that this is length of spherical metric. What is this? This is just I have to integrate over f of gamma. Okay, I have to integrate over f of gamma. I have to integrate over modulus of d z uh, sub s. I'll keep putting the sub s to just emphasize that I have to integrate over an element of the uh, spherical arc length. But what is uh, uh, what is the element of spherical arc length? You see. Uh, 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 so in, in fact I, I think I, I should not put uh, yeah so it is important that uh, my, uh, my my variable let me call this variable as w okay and I should be careful 
inadvertently you make mistakes like this. See, I'm integrating over f of gamma, so my variable should be in f of uh, in f of gamma, a uh, variable of integration, and that has to be not z. Z is in the source. Z is on gamma, whereas uh, w is what is on f of gamma. So you know if this should not have been z. I should correct this. This should be a d uh, d w sub s. Okay, it's an element of arc length. Spherical arc length with respect to the variable w on the sphere. All right, where w is f of z. So this transformation is given by w equal to f of z. Okay, and the only funny thing is that this w is now on the sphere. Mind you, w can uh, take the value of the north pole, which is corresponding to w equal to infinity. That's also allowed now. Okay, because we have allowed values in c c union, c union infinity extended plane. All right, now. You see, but what is this? What is this? Uh, what is this uh, element of spherical arc length? I told you that uh, last time that the element of spherical arc length is actually uh, two times mod d w, the usual Euclidean uh, element of arc length, divided by one plus mod w, the whole square. This is what the element of spherical arc length is, and see the, you know, the reason. Why you got this is if you want uh, uh, as an aside. Let me write that down, you know, and and use a different color. So you see, uh, so what happened was that if you take the spherical distance between two points w1 and w2, okay, then that turned out to be two times mod w1 minus w2 by uh, square root of one plus mod w1 the whole square into square root of one plus mod w2 the whole square. This is the spherical uh, distance between two points W1 and W2 on the uh, uh, on the extended plane or the Riemann sphere. Okay, this is the spherical distance. It is actually the <coughs> uh, um, uh, uh, in fact I should not even say this is not spherical distance. Sorry, this is actually the this is the caudal distance. In fact, okay, yeah, this is still not the infinitesimal version. Sorry. So this is the d sub c. This is the caudal distance. So you take two points uh, 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 W1 here. And W two, and you join them by this chord. Okay, it's a the line segment. It's a line segment in three space joining those two points on the Riemann sphere. But you see, mind you, those two points are actually points on the extended plane. I'm simply identifying the extended plane with the Riemann sphere. So I'm still writing W one and W two, where actually I mean the proje stereographic projection of. Uh, I mean the stereographic projection of W one and the stereographic projection of W two. Okay, so uh, see if so this is the this is the chord this is the chordal distance. This is the caudal metric, and what is this metric? This metric is a metric in R three. Mind you, this 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 sphere, this Riemann sphere, is sitting inside R three. This is this is inside R three. Okay, and in R three, I am simply measuring the distance, and I ask you to check that this is a this is an exercise for you to check that. Uh, oops, uh, it's an exercise for you to check that this is the this is the distance formula. Okay, I ask you to do that. You should try. You should do it if you have not done it so far. Now you see this is the this is the caudal arc length. If I want the spheric, what is the spherical arc length? The spherical arc length is this this arc length. And what is that arc length? I take the great circle. There is only one big circle on the on the rim on the sphere which passes through these two points. And that circle uh, with these two points, uh, two points in a circle determine a minor arc and a major arc. Okay. And you take the length of the minor arc. That's the definition of uh, uh, spherical distance. So, uh, so if I want the if I want the spherical length, okay, and I want the infinitesimal spherical length, that is that is what this quantity is. This d w sub s is the infinitesimal element of spherical length, and for that, what I'll have to do is I'll have to bring w one and w two very very close, okay, and as I bring w one and w two very very close, the caudal distance will approximate. The it will come close to the uh, uh, spherical distance. Okay, so what I do is you know in this in this calculation in the in this formula, what you do is you put w two is equal to w one plus delta w. Okay, and uh, then and then you write it in such a way that you only allow uh, you only worry about delta w and don't worry about delta w whole square delta w whole cube higher order terms because you. Uh, Think of them as being very small and negligible, and then you change the delta w to dw. So what will happen is that this will 
this thing, this, this formula as W1 tends to W2, okay, this formula will give you this formula. So you see in the, in the, in the, in the, in the numerator instead of W2, if you put W1 plus delta W, the new numerator will become 2 delta W and this, uh, both of these quantities will become uh, equal to root of 1 plus uh, W squared. So you will get uh, the square of that which is 1 plus mod W the whole square. So, so each of these quantities will become square root of, uh, so the first, this, the second term will become square root of 1 plus W1 plus delta W mod the whole square, okay. And as delta W tends to 0, you will get this quantity. So this is the, uh, this is how you get this infinitesimal uh, element of spherical arc length. And integrating over uh, that, uh, integrating that over the curve f of dub, f of omega, should give you the length of f of omega, the spherical length of f of omega, which is what we are interested in, okay. But then in this you plug in what w is, see your w is fz, so plug fz inside that. If you plug fz inside that, what will you get? You'll, you will end up with, well, okay, let me, let me go back to the other color that I was using. Uh, yeah, so what will I get? I will get, well, uh, I will get integral. Uh, since I have changed, I have made a change of variable w equal to f of z, now the variable becomes z and z now varies over, um, uh, over gamma, so I will put gamma here, okay. And if I now calculate this, mod uh, dfz will become mod f dash of z into dz. So what I will get is 2 mod f dash of z mod dz by 1 plus mod f of z the whole square. And what is this? If you look at it carefully, what is this? This is just 2 times, uh, sorry, this is just integral over gamma, oops, this is just integral over gamma 2 mod f dash of z divided by 1 plus mod f z the whole squared, this whole thing multiplied by mod dz. So what are you getting? You are getting length of the image curve and in, in the spherical uh, uh, metric of gamma under f is this formula and go you go back to what I was telling you some time ago. If you want the length of the image curve, you have to multiply by the modulus of the derivative, okay. If you simply integrate, you will get the length of the source curve. But if you multiply by the modulus of the derivative, you will get the length of the image curve. So you see, what this tells you, this tells you that if you want the length, the spherical length of the image curve f gamma under f, you will have to multiply by this, this, this quantity here and that quantity therefore has to be the absolute value of the spherical derivative. Therefore the spherical derivative, so this is what we call as the, uh, so this is what is called as f hash of z. This is called the spherical derivative. of f, okay. And uh, mind you, this is, this is, I should write it in bracket, it is in absolute value. This is an absolute value, all right, because it is a, so you must remember, you know, go back to your, your first course in complex analysis, when you take f dash of z, okay. If you take a point z naught, if you take f dash of z naught where uh, suppose z0 is a point where function is analytic, so the derivative exists, you take f dash of z0, what is, a, what is the geometric significance of f dash of z0? See the modulus of f dash of z0 is the scaling factor, it is locally the factor by which an image is scaled. If you take some, uh, if you take a small square uh, containing z0, a very small square containing z0 and you take its image under f, you will get something that looks like a square, okay, okay and its uh, area will be, uh, you know, its length will be scaled by mod f dash. So the, the modulus of the derivative is a scaling factor, the argument of the derivative is a rotating factor, it is a factor of rotation, okay. But the argument of f dash of z0 is the angle by which the tangent rotates, okay. If you have a source point, and you have a curve passing through the source point z0 and you have tangent at that point. Now you take the image curve which will pass through f of z0 the image point and you take the tangent there, 
the difference in the uh, angles that the tangents make with the x axis is precisely argument of f dash of z naught okay. So the geometric meaning of the of f dash of z naught is that the modulus of f dash of z naught gives locally at z naught the magnification factor and the argument of f dash of z naught gives locally the rotation factor. This is how geometrically the map f behaves locally and you know if the derivative f is f dash is not 0 then you know it is conformal you would have studied this in a first course. Conformal means you know it will preserve angles between curves okay. So, uh, so for example if you take something like a uh, something like a square okay its image will be something like a distorted square alright. If you take something like a circle its image will be something like a distorted circle you can expect it to be like for, a, for example something like a, an ellipse or something like that okay and this is of course if you consider it sufficiently small okay and the, at, at a point where the derivative does not vanish okay and this is why it has got so many applications to engineering because of conformality. So you see the why I am saying trying to tell you all this is that the modulus of the derivative is the magnification factor and therefore multiplying by uh, multiplying the infinitesimal arc length by the modulus of the derivative always gives you the uh, length of the arc length of the image curve and that is what is happening here you see this is the multiplication factor. This multiplication factor is therefore called the spherical derivative okay. Now I want to tell you a few things uh, a few very very interesting things in, in this uh, integral. Uh, see first and foremost uh, the, the amazing thing about this is that you know uh, I told you f is a meromorphic function okay f is a meromorphic function. So uh, uh, you see uh, f could have poles okay f could have poles of course they are isolated but f can have poles and the beautiful thing is your curve gamma you see your curve gamma can pass through those poles okay now that is the amazing thing. See normally when you do integration uh, you never try it, you, the, the integrand is always supposed to be continuous okay. When you integrate an analytic function or for example whenever you do Cauchy's theorem or uh, you know you, you, you do argument principle in all these, uh, in all these uh, things when you want to apply you always make sure that the contour does not pass through any singular points it cannot pass through poles it cannot there are cases when you are doing the logarithmic integral in the in the uh, argument principle you will assume that the contour does not pass through any poles and also through any zeros okay you do not allow the contour even to pass through zeros because you are integrating the logarithmic derivative which is f dash by f and if there is a zero then a denominator f will have a zero then you cannot integrate it. So in all these things that you have been that we have been doing so far we always make sure that the contour on which you are we are integrating does not pass through any zeros or poles. It should never pass through poles of course but also not through zeros if you are trying to apply the argument principle. But now mind you we are not we are dealing with meromorphic functions they have poles and my point is now the contour gamma can pass through as many poles as you want it will not create any problems okay it will not create any problems for this integral. Because you see that is a matter of calculation that you have to understand. I will I will tell you roughly suppose uh, your, your, uh, uh, your contour gamma passes through uh, some poles mind you there can be only finitely many such poles on the contour because you see the set of poles is anyway an isolated set by definition a pole is isolated okay it is an isolated singularity. So the set of poles is an isolated set and if you take the set of poles lying on gamma it is an isolated set it is an isolated subset of a compact set mind you gamma is a uh, uh, gamma is compact any 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 contour is compact it is closed and bounded okay because it is uh, it is actually continuous image of an interval closed and bounded interval. So it is closed and bounded it is compact and you know any isolated subset of a compact set is finite because had it be if it were in infinite uh, it will have a limit point okay and the, that limit point will not be isolated the, okay. Therefore uh, what will happen is that you, you, you have, uh, you have uh, if, if gamma passes through poles of f 
mind you, F is a meromorphic, it could have poles. If gamma passes through four poles of F, it can pass through only finitely many poles because gamma is compact. And what happens at a pole? See, nothing happens to the integrand at a pole. It's bounded. That's the beautiful thing. That's why this this integral is valid even if gamma passes through a pole or several poles. That's because you just imagine. Suppose F has a pole at Z naught. Okay, then. Uh, uh, in fact, you know, we can write this down. Uh, suppose, uh, uh, so let me write this down. Uh, suppose f of z, uh, so, so let me rub this and probably go down a little bit so that I have more space. Suppose, uh, oops, suppose f has a pole at z0 which is lying on gamma this will create this will not create any problems this will not create any problems why because you see uh, in <coughs> in a small disk uh, uh, centered at gamma say, uh, sorry centered at uh, z naught you see f of z will look like g of z by z minus z naught to the power of n where n is the order of the pole Okay. Now you calculate you calculate this quantity. Okay. Notice that uh, and and of course you know g of z naught is not zero. Okay. G of z naught is not zero and uh, of course uh, uh, this is how a uh, pole uh, locally function looks locally at a pole of order n. All right. And g is of course analytic. Okay. G g analytic. At, uh, at Z naught. Okay, you have this. Now you see, just look at this expression that I've written above. If I take f dash, if I take the derivative, the derivative will co uh, will continue to have a pole of one more order. If I differentiate this g z by z minus z naught power n, if you want using quotient rule, then I'll get a z minus z naught to the n plus one in the denominator. So what, what I'll get is I'll get a I'll get a pole of higher order, okay, of order greater order. And uh, if you if you go to the denominator, the denominator will have a one by it will have a mod g z the whole squared by z minus z naught to the power of two n. And as z tends to z naught, you will see that the numerator tends to uh, I mean the, the, this whole quantity will go to uh, uh, either zero or to a finite value. Okay. Because what because what is actually happening is that as z tends to z naught, z minus z naught is going to go to zero, so f is going to infinity, all right. But the fact is that the denominator will go to infinity faster than the numerator because the denominator contains f squared. F squared has a pole of order two n, whereas the numerator has a pole of order only n plus one. Okay. Therefore, the denominator will go to fa infinity faster than the numerator. As a result, the integrand is bounded. So the point is that this integral is valid even at a pole. That is the big deal there. So this integral is your gamma can pass through poles of f. There is no problem. And geometrically also you should believe this because if gamma passes through a pole of f, its image will pass through the north pole on the Riemann sphere after all at a pole of f, f is taking the value infinity and that corresponds to the north pole on the Riemann sphere. So after all what you are saying is that the image curve is passing through the north pole of the sphere. How does it matter? It is not going to affect, uh, it is it's, it's no, the no, a north pole of the sphere is in no way different from any other point on the sphere. Okay. So the moral of the story is that uh, shows that uh, uh, the uh, uh, L s of f gamma is well defined even if gamma passes through poles okay so this formula is uh, always works it works even for a meromorphic function it even works if gamma passes through poles now that, that is a very very important thing okay and then there's uh, uh, so this is something that you need to know and uh, there is another fact that I will expand into in the next lecture 
uh, the fact is that if you take the reciprocal of f, you see if f is a meromorphic function, then 1 by f is also a meromorphic function and the beautiful thing is that if you take each spherical derivative, you will get exactly the same as a spherical derivative of f. The reason is because of the fact that the spherical distance is invariant under inversion. I told you the inversion on the complex plane translates to a rotation of the Riemann sphere about the x-axis and it leaves spherical distances invariant. Therefore, the spherical derivative is also invariant if you invert the function. Okay? So, this is another important fact that we use and the advantage that you can replace f by 1 by f is that whenever f has a pole, 1 by f has a 0. So, you can reduce from the meromorphic case to the analytic case. So, you can still work with analytic functions. You see, this is the advantage of having the spherical derivative. Okay? So, uh, the spher spherical derivative does not distinguish between f and 1 by f. And the advantage of moving from f to 1 by f is that you can re what is a pole for f becomes a 0 for 1 by f and zeros are very friendly, more friendlier than poles. Okay? You, in, in the neighborhood of a 0, you can usual, you apply usual analytic function theory because the function is after all analytic. Okay? So, that is the advantage. So, that is another motivation for having the spherical derivative. Okay? So, I will stop here.